Thanks for joining us for Pact. I'm the P, Peter Coffin. This is the ACD, the lovely Miss Astronaut Cowboy Doctor, Master of Science. Together we're Pact, P-A-C-D. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, your favorite podcast service. Also, leave us a glowing review on Audible or Apple Podcasts. Help us keep the lights on by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash pactpod. That's P-A-C-D-P-O-D. Your monthly support gets you into the Discord server, gets you exclusive content, and you get to see some content before anyone else. We've also got fantastic pact merch available. Finally, tell your friends. We rely so big on word of mouth. We stream 7 p.m. Eastern every Saturday. Thank you so much for tuning in. So, part three of Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. This is a, a lengthier episode just because th- this is the the meat and potatoes. You, you got the, the appetizers. You got your salad. All necessary components of the meal. This this is the, the meat and potatoes of historical materialism. And there are some things that have been referenced briefly earlier on that we've had some questions about that are going to be further delved into in this section that we are happy to clarify. So part three of Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Frederick Engels. The materialist conception of history starts from the proposition that the production of the means to support human life and next to production, the exchange of things produced is the basis of all social structure. That in every society that has appeared in history, the manner in which wealth is distributed and society divided into classes or orders is dependent upon what is produced, how it is produced, and how the products are exchanged. From this point of view, the final causes of all social changes and political revolutions are to be sought not in men's brains, not in men's better insights into eternal truth and justice, but in changes in the modes of production and exchange. They are to be sought not in the philosophy, but in the economics of each particular epoch. The growing perception that existing social institutions are unreasonable and unjust, that reason has become unreason and right wrong, is only proof that in the modes of production and exchange, changes have silently taken place with which the social order adapted to earlier economic conditions is no longer in keeping. From this, it also follows that the means of getting rid of the incongruities that have been brought to light must also be present in a more or less developed condition within the changed modes of production themselves. These means are not to be invented by deduction from fundamental principles but are to be discovered in the stubborn facts of the existing system of production. But why are you always criticizing? Why can't you put forward a vision of a future we can believe in? That's why. Today, when uh, we were reviewing that, Peter said, I'm going to make a very big deal about that. So I was tightening my <laughs> asshole when I was doing that because I knew it was coming. Uh, <laughs> all right. So this is all review from last time. We're, we're not drawing from an abstract platonic truth and justice. The way that society operates is completely contingent upon its economic base. The development of productive forces and exchange are the foundational component that all social structures consist in. What is then the position of modern socialism in this connection? The present situation of society, this is now pretty generally conceded, is the creation of the ruling class today of the bourgeoisie. The mode of production peculiar to the bourgeoisie, known since Marx as the capitalist mode of production, was incompatible with the feudal system with the privileges that conferred upon individuals, entire social ranks, and local corporations, as well as with the hereditary ties of subordination which constituted the framework of its social organization. The bourgeoisie broke up the feudal system and built upon its ruins the capitalist order of society, the kingdom of free competition, of personal liberty, of the equality before the law, of all commodity owners, of all the rest of the capitalist blessings. Thenceforward, the capitalist mode of production could develop in freedom, since steam, machinery, and the making of machines by machinery transformed the older manufacture into modern industry. 
the productive forces evolved under the guidance of the bourgeoisie developed with a rapidity and in a degree unheard of before. But just as the older manufacturer in its time and handicraft becoming more developed under its influence had come into collision with the feudal trammels of the guilds, so now modern industry in its complete development comes into collision with the bounds within which the capitalist mode of production holds it confined. The new productive forces have already outgrown the capitalist mode of using them, and this conflict between productive forces and modes of production is not a conflict engendered in the mind of man, like that between original sin and divine justice. It exists, in fact, objectively outside of us, independently of the will and actions, even of the men that have brought it on. Modern socialism is nothing but the reflex and thought of this conflict in fact its ideal reflection in the minds first of the class directly suffering under it, the working class. All that's saying is giving historical context from the movement out of feudalism into capitalist society. And then with the introduction of industrial machinery and the modes by which things are produced, how that pushes beyond the limits of the transformed capitalistic system that we mm -hmm. know of. Mm -hmm. Um, before this happened, though, we just want to confirm the context of why did capitalism need to break with the social order of the previous time um, and feudalism? And that's because it's incompatible with feudal law and social structures and has to be broken up such that capitalism can operate in the free market of which it purports. But now Angles is setting the stage for the technological advances of the time and the advances in the mode of production that we'll talk about with the socialization of production is now pushing against the boundaries of this new uh, economic base and capitalism. And that is going to be a conduit to antagonisms and class contradictions um, that lead to collision in the market and market implosion. And we'll mm -hmm. talk about that. So now in what does this conflict consist? Before capitalist production, i.e. in the Middle Ages, the system of petty industry obtained generally based upon the private property of the laborers in their means of production, in the country, the agriculture of the small peasant, freeman, or serf, in the towns, the handicrafts organized in the guilds. The instruments of labor, land, agricultural implements, the workshop, the tool, were the instruments of labor of single individuals, adapted for the use of one worker, and therefore, of necessity, small, dwarfish, circumscribed. But for this very reason, they belonged as a rule to the producer himself. To concentrate these scattered, limited means of production, to enlarge them, to turn them into the powerful levers of production of the present day, this was precisely the historic role of capitalist production and of its upholder, the bourgeoisie. And the fourth section of capital, Marx has explained in detail how since the 15th century, this has been historically worked out through the three phases of simple cooperation, manufacture, and modern industry. But the bourgeoisie, as it is shown there, could not transform these puny means of production into mighty productive forces without transforming them at the same time from the means of production of the individual into social means of production only workable by collectivity of men. The spinning wheel, the handy loom, the blacksmith's hammer were replaced by the spinning machine, the power loom, and the steam hammer. The individual workshop by the factory, implying the cooperation of hundreds of thousands of workmen. In like manner, production itself changed from a series of individual into a series of social acts, and the production from individual to social products. The yarn, the cloth, the metal articles that now come out of the factory were the joint product of many workers, through whose hands they had successively to pass before they were ready. No one person could say of them, I made that, that is my product. Alienation. That's a, yeah, exactly. That is about the alienation of worker from product of labor. Um, Resulting from moving from individualized production based off of a more individualized need to the socialization of production. And in the socialization of production, one takes on a specific role in the production as opposed to starting with materials that you possess, using tools that you possess, doing labor yourself all going into one single craft being right. put forward. Now one might be a single stop on an assembly line. Yeah, you're you're not a watchmaker anymore. You're the guy that puts the 
the little hand on. Yeah, you're the little hand screwer. And and then you you you're the little hand screwer, and then you never see that watch and the thousands of other watches that you little hand screw on at any time. But you do get a couple hundred bucks every week. Cool. <laughs> But where, in a given society, the fundamental form of production is that spontaneous division of labor which creeps in gradually and not upon any preconceived plan. There the products take on the form of commodities, whose mutual exchange, buying and selling, enable the individual producers to satisfy their manifold wants. And this was the case in the Middle Ages. The peasant, e.g., sold to the artisan agricultural products and bought from him the products of handicraft. Into this society of individual producers, of commodity producers, the new mode of production thrust itself. In the midst of the old division of labor, grown up spontaneously upon no definite plan, which had governed the whole of society, now arose division of labor upon a definite plan, as organized in the factory, side by side with individual production, appeared social production. The products of both were sold in the same market and, therefore, at prices at least approximately equal. But organization upon a definite plan was stronger than spontaneous division of labor. The factories working with the combined social forces of a collectivity of individuals produced their commodities far more cheaply than the individual small producers. Individual producers succumbed in one department after another. Socialized production revolutionized all the old methods of production, but its revolutionary character was, at the same time, so little recognized that it was, on the contrary, introduced as a means of increasing and developing the production of commodities. When it arose, it found ready-made and made liberal use of certain machinery for the production and exchange of commodities, merchants' capital, handicraft, wage labor. Socialized production thus introducing itself as a new form of the production of commodities, it was a matter, of course, that under it the old forms of appropriation remained in full swing and were applied to its products as well. Essentially, we're talking about how uh, the productive forces have already outgrowed the capitalistic mode of using them. The market created the commodity form. You produce something in order to exchange it at market. That's a commodity. The means to create commodities developed into socialized production. And in the meantime, your individualized laborers, the actual productive forces in the feudal arrangement, did not have the means to continue laboring in the same way that they did. Um, the productive forces becoming... Uh, in conflict with the mode of production. Right. But the appropriation of products, profit to those laborers does not catch up with that. Uh, the privatization of products and profit um, remains individualized and privatized mm -hmm. in the hands of the capitalist. Exactly. And that is the contradiction that Engels is explicitly about to lay out. In the medieval stage of evolution of the production of commodities, the question as to the owner of the product of labor could not arise. The individual producer, as a rule, had, from raw material belonging to himself, and generally his own handiwork, produced it with his own tools, by the labor of his own hands or of his family. There was no need for him to appropriate the new product. It belonged wholly to him, as a matter of course. His property was in the product. His property in the product was, therefore, based upon his own labor. Even where external help was used, this was, as a rule, of little importance and very generally was compensated by something other than wages. The apprentices and journeymen at the guilds worked less for board and wages than for education in order that they might become master craftsmen themselves. So in feudal times, it was very clear whose uh, product was produced by whom. It was very clear that you, with your own raw materials placed in front of you, you were the watchmaker. And, and this is very clearly a product of your labor. And, and again, he talks about like people who are, are learning from the labor or the producer, what have you. Um, they might help out with that, um, but that doesn't really matter so much because they're learning and they're being educated and, and that's part of their apprenticeship, whatever. It's very clear that the product is a result of the producer's worked work, just unambiguously, um, because they made it. And therefore, it doesn't have to be appropriate. It doesn't have to be um, given to someone or uh, designated someone's or anything like that. It is simply the product of the producer and therefore the producer's. Then came the concentration of the means of production and of the producers in large workshops and manufactories 
their transformation into actual socialized means of production and socialized producers. But the socialized producers and means of production and their products were still treated after this change just as they had been before. That is, as the means of production and the products of individuals. Hitherto, the owner of the instruments of labor had himself appropriated the product because, as a rule, it was his own product and the assistance of others was the exception. Now the owner of the instruments of labor always appropriated to himself the product, although it was no longer his product, but exclusively the product of the labor of others. Right. So this is just basic communism 101. Seize the means of production. This is somebody else now when production has been socialized has the means of production at the top the capitalist the owner of the means to make the product then appropriation it's not appropriated to anyone according to this new socialized mode of production um it's in the same way just as if you know individual watchmakers made their products and it was clearly theirs and so no appropriation was needed now all of that is not appropriated to all of the collective workers who, who are involved in making these products and are involved in production, but goes to the owner of the means, the capitalist. So there's a mismatch or a contradiction between the socialization of production and the sustained individualization of profits and products and how they're appropriated. I'm about to say that in different words. Pro multiple times, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Thus, the products now produced socially were not appropriated by those who actually set in motion the means of production and actually produced the commodities, but by the capitalists. Hello. The means of production and production itself had become, in essence, socialized, but they were subjected to a form of appropriation which presupposes the private production of individuals, under which, therefore, everyone owns its product and brings it to the market. The capitalist is behaving, and this is going to sound really intuitive, um, as if they were the individual who produced the product that is the collective result of the laborers. Still saying, I made that. That's my product. Right. Which is a quote from Engels describing what in feudal times a producer could say because he made the watch. He made the whole thing. So so that small group of individuals, the, the capitalists say, it's my product. I made that because they own the means of production by which the laborers activate those means of production and produce commodities. All right. The mode of production is subjected to this form of appropriation, although it abolishes the conditions upon which the latter rests. This contradiction, which gives to the new mode of production its capitalistic character, contains the germ of the whole social antagonisms of today. The greater the mastery obtained by the new mode of production over all important fields of production in all manufacturing countries, the more it reduced individual production to an insignificant residuum, the more clearly was brought out the incompatibility of socialized production with capitalistic appropriation. The first capitalists found, as we have said, alongside other forms of labor, wage labor ready-made for them on the market. But it was exceptional, complementary, accessory, transitory wage labor. The agricultural laborer, though upon occasion he hired himself out by the day, had a few acres of his own land on which he could at all events live at a pinch. It's funny that he's saying that, like, you need a few acres to support yourself as one person and, like, an yeah. like in a pinch, like, to, to scarcely sustain yourself. And then we have... Let's talk about community gardens yeah. uh, uh, and how we're going to feed the whole neighborhood with 400 square feet. Ah! Yeah. The guilds were so organized that the journeymen of today became the master of tomorrow. But all this changed as soon as the means of production became socialized and concentrated in the hands of the capitalist. The means of production, as well as the product of the individual producer, became more and more worthless. Remember, producer here means worker. And yes. that's something that it's used in a very vague way. But he's, he's talking about in feudal times transitioning between being the individual producer, the sole producer of a product, and transitioning to be not an individual producer, but a collective piece of socialized production that is putting out products. The means of production, as well as the product of the individual producer, became more and more worthless. There was nothing left for him but to turn wage worker under the capitalist. Wage labor, after time the exception 
and accessory now became the rule and basis of all production, after time complementary, and now became the sole remaining function of the worker. The wage worker for a time became a wage worker for life. The number of these permanent was further enormously increased by the breaking up of the feudal system that occurred at the same time, by disbanding of the retainers of the feudal lords, the eviction of the peasants from their homesteads, etc. The separation was made complete between the means of production concentrated in the hands of the capitalists on one side and the producers possessing nothing but their labor power on the other. The contradiction between socialized production and capitalistic appropriation manifested itself as the antagonism of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. That line is just, it's key to understand and, and keep in mind as we move forward. And it's really easy to make the mistake that when they're saying producer, they might mean this uh, owner of the socialized means of production as an entity. Right. But it's not. It's talking about this transition from being an individual producer to being a wage worker. This fundamental contradiction that, that exists in this emergent capitalist framework and still exists today, even in a a more extreme sense yeah, yeah, in, in the imperial stage. The contradiction is that production has been socialized, whereas the appropriation of products and profits has remained the same. So a lot of people are contributing to creating commodities, but the person reaping the profits is that one person as if they were the individual laborer that mm -hmm. produced its one-to-one -one product. So in this contradiction, what Engels is ultimately going to propose is that eventually, appropriation needs to catch up with production and becoming socialized. Yes. We've seen that the capitalistic mode of production thrust its way into a society of commodity producers, of individual producers, whose social bond was the exchange of their products. But every society based upon the production of commodities has this peculiarity, that the producers have lost control over their own social interrelations. Each man produces for himself, which such means with such means of production as he may happen to have, and for such exchange as he may require to satisfy his remaining wants. No one knows how much of his particular article is coming on the market, nor how much of it will be wanted. No one knows whether his individual product will meet an actual demand, whether he will be able to make good his cost of production or even sell his commodity at all. Anarchy reigns in socialized production. Okay. That paragraph is actually talking about individual producers as workers, as individuals who used to be individual producers, one-to-one -one corresponding to individual products, who have now transitioned into wage laborers who are also part of production, but in a socialized collective manner where they have no idea um, where their product's going. They have no idea where their watches and the big group of watches are the ones that they did the little hand screw on. They don't know. That is not talking about capitalists competing blindly with one another in the context of anarchy of production, but is talking about how the conditions result in alienation of the worker because there's no direct connection to the product that you produce as a laborer. Um, so this gets back to very early on in our part one, where Engels just briefly references anarchy of production. And I was a little imprecise. In the first part of this book, he, he brings up the anarchy of production and we sort of just was like, oh, let's try and get a definition there just so that we have some ideas to what's going on here. Rather than waiting for the third part in which there is a long discussion on anarchy of production, where we constantly reference that, so we want to clear up what that means. I said in our part one, that is related to the idea of supply side not acquiescing to the market and that they have a dictatorial role, especially maybe not so much in Angle's time, but in the 21st century, especially in dictating advertising, marketing the supply chains. Um, but it was a little off base and trying to connect that to anarchy of production as Engels is describing it in a historical material context in his historical context. What I should have said in a more general way is that it's the idea that the market doesn't acquiesce to demand. Um, this results in the overproduction of goods that we don't need. We have warehouses full of fidget spinners that never get sold. 
um, and underproduction of necessities. And when they are available and they are produced, they are not affordable for the worker to consume. So we have a warehouse full of fidget spinners, a shortage of necessary products. Um, well, like in Hurricane Katrina, there was, for instance, a shortage of water. Right. And and that, especially in Engel's time, made it so that producers and even capitalists themselves were competing without wherewithal of exactly what was going to be sold, um, what was going to meet an actual demand. I want to add that all of those factors are as a result now basically inseparable from the fact that the ruling class is who is in control of production. So in feudalism, a lot of the sort of misdeeds and and bad things were sort of out in the open. And the way that competition manifested isn't necessarily like, oh, well, I'm going to make the best product to meet this demand. That's not really how that worked out. It's competing interests between different factions of the ruling class. It is ultimately a, a, a result of the unaccountable concentration of power in a ruling class in which the market is the means that exchange is exercised. You have the ruling class and their factions and competing interests and aspects of even their cooperation that are working in conflict with what would ultimately work out in the market. The market can be unpredictable, even if nowadays various internal supply chains operate a lot like a planned economy. For instance, we reference the People's Republic of Walmart. The players in the market own and have capital and have power. The consumer, the member of the working class, the everyday person doesn't have even vaguely the kind of power that an individual capitalist, some alliance between capitalists or an organization or corporation has. And therefore, the decisions of the capitalists are reflective specifically of the interests of a tiny number of people whose whims may be based on experience in the market and may have the ability to predict something, may have insider information, or may not, may have no idea what's going to happen from day to day. The decisions that are being made by the powerful people aren't guaranteed even to be the right decisions by their own interests. And the interests that they're operating on are so fundamentally different from the vast majority of people that you still end up with that warehouse full of fidget spinners while people starve somewhere. The contrast is a planned economy, which is organized around the needs of the people living in the society. We were also kind of like wrapped up in applying it to contemporary times. Yeah, we were wrapped up. And so like Engels and Marx couldn't have predicted, um, but they really couldn't have uh, the extent to which capital today in the imperial stages can dictate. Yeah. But the production of commodities, like every other form of production, has a peculiar inherent laws inseparable from it. And these laws work despite anarchy in and through anarchy. They reveal themselves in the only persistent form of social interrelations, that is, in exchange. And here they affect the individual producers as compulsory laws of competition. They are at first unknown to these producers themselves and have to be discovered by them gradually and as the result of experience. They work themselves out, therefore, independently of the producers and in antagonism to them as inexorable natural laws of their particular form of production. The product governs the producers. What Engels means by that is that each mode of production has its own inherent laws to it. And one of capitalism's fundamental laws in that base is competition um, among capitalists who compete for market share, who compete for profits, who compete for consumers in demand. And the key point is that competition doesn't actually exist and that every capitalist consciously agrees to it. Um, and if they have the choice, um, which again, this is why it gets a little bit more complicated as we move into imperial stages, um, they would take all of the market share and yeah. monopolize it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so instead, the nature and conditions of the mode of production and capitalism make these laws inevitable independently of 
the capitalists and workers who operate inside it. Later, he says, the ever-increasing perfectibility of modern machinery is, by the anarchy of social production, turned into a compulsory law that forces the individual industrial capitalist always to improve his machinery, always to increase his productive force. So again, continuing towards that increasingly socialized mode of production where individualized appropriation of profits still exists and is, is going to the capitalists who are saying, this is my product, despite it being the product of a collective organization of socialized production through wage laborers. All right. In medieval society, especially in the earlier centuries, production was essentially directed towards satisfying the wants of the individual. It satisfied, in the main, only the wants of the producer and his family, where relations and personal dependence existed as in the country, and also helped to satisfy the wants of the feudal lord. In all this, there was, therefore, no exchange. The products, consequently, did not assume the character of commodities. The family of the peasant produced almost everything they wanted, clothes and furniture, as well as the means of subsistence. Only when it began to produce more than was sufficient to supply its own wants and the payments of kind to the feudal lords, only then did it also produce commodities. This surplus, thrown into socialized exchange and offered for sale, became commodities. The artisan in the towns, it is true, had from the first to produce for exchange, but they also themselves supplied the greatest part of their individual wants. They had gardens and plots of land. They turned their cattle out into the communal forest, which also yielded them timber and firing. The woman spun flax, wool, and so forth. Production for the purpose of exchange, production of commodities, was only in its infancy. Hence, exchange was restricted. The market narrowed, the methods of production stable. There was local exclusiveness without, local unity within. The mark in the country, in the town, the guild. But with the extension of the production of commodities, and especially with the introduction of the capitalist mode of production, the loss of commodity production, hitherto latent, came into action more openly and with greater force. The old bonds were loosened, the old exclusive limits broke through, and producers were more and more turned into independent, isolated producers of commodity. It became apparent that the production of society at large was ruled by absence of plan, by absence, by anarchy. And this anarchy grew to a greater and greater height. But the chief means, by aid of which the capitalist mode of production intensified this anarchy of socialized production, was the exact opposite of anarchy. It was the increasing organization of production upon a social basis in every individual productive establishment. By this, the old, peaceful, stable condition of things was ended. As the ruling class, an unaccountable entity, people who are simply working in their own interests, owning everything, the means of production, and therefore the means by which society's uh, dynamics spring forward. The anarchy is referring to the fact that there isn't a plan. They're simply acting in their own interests. They don't know every single factor going in. Reading into the negative space of that, the solution is a proletarian state with a planned economy. <laughs> and that's, that's part of what you need to think about when you're analyzing things dialectically. What's the antithesis of this? Right. What, what is in the negative space? Exactly. You're doing a, a case conceptualization of society. <laughs> All right. Wherever this organization of production was introduced into a branch of industry, it brooked no other method of production by its side. The field of labor became a battleground. The great geographical discoveries and the colonization following them multiplied markets and quickened the transformation of handicraft into manufacture. The war did not simply break out between the individual producers of particular localities. The local struggles begat, in their turn, national conflicts, the commercial wars of the 17th and 18th centuries. Finally, modern industry and the opening of the world market made the struggle universal and at the same time gave it an unheard of virulence. Advantages in natural or artificial conditions of production now decide the existence or non-existence of individual capitalists, as well as of whole industries and countries. He that falls flat is remorselessly cast aside. It is the Darwinian struggle of the individual for existence transferred from nature to society with intensified violence. The conditions of existence natural to the animal appear as the final term of human development. 
The contradiction between socialized production and capitalistic appropriation now presents itself as an antagonism between the organization of production in the individual workshop and the anarchy of production in society generally. He's just really doubling down on this concept. Yeah. Like we said, uh, we're going to say this many times. In many um, ways. In many ways. It's not redundant because he's talking about it as it progresses from feudal to infant capitalism to where capitalism is at the time that he's writing this. But he's really just doubling down on the same thing because that class contradiction is so fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, that, I mean, that's... That is the, the means of production, yeah. whatever, mm -hmm. like that's the whole thing. The capitalistic mode of production moves in these two forms of antagonism imminent to it from its very origin. It is never able to get out of the vicious circle which Fourier had already discovered. What Fourier could not indeed see at this time is that the circle is gradually narrowing, that the movement becomes more and more a spiral and must come to an end, like the movement of planets by collision with the center. It is the compelling force of anarchy in the production of society at large that more and more completely turns the great majority of men into proletarians. And it is the masses of the proletariat, again, who will finally put an end to the anarchy in production. It is the compelling force of anarchy in social production that turns the limitless perfectibility of machinery under modern industry into a compulsory law by which every individual industrial capitalist must perfect his machinery more and more under penalty of ruin. Now, just to be clear, that isn't necessarily true now. <laughs> yeah. You might see capitalists using the same shit from the 1970s still. <laughs> A lot. And the reason is because there are different dynamics at play. And this is kind of what threw us is we were trying to adapt things to modern times. Ingalls existed in industrial capitalism. We exist in post-monopoly, post-financial, imperial stage capitalism. Today, we see a capitalism that's very often not innovating. That doesn't mean Ingalls is wrong. It means some of the conditions are currently different. Ingalls describes things that were at play in Ingalls' time. And in microcosm, they still can happen now. Uh, it's just that monopoly affects this dynamic a lot. And Lenin analyzes these developments as well as some others since then. Innovation can also be a more hidden factor, like the innovation happening in, say, how data is collected or how something that appears free is actually being exchanged as some novel form of commodity. The general analysis at play, though, however, is still valid. But the perfecting of machinery is making human labor superfluous. If the introduction and increase of machinery means the displacement of millions of manual by a few machine workers, improvement in machinery means the displacement of more and more of the machine workers themselves. It means, in the last instance, the production of a number of available wage workers in excess of the average needs of capital, the formation of a complete industrial reserve army, as I called it in 1845 available at times when industry is working at high pressure to be cast out upon the street when the inevitable crash comes, a constant dead weight upon the limbs of the working class in its struggle for existence with capital, a regulator for keeping of wages down to the low level that suits the interests of capital. Thus it comes about, to quote Marx, the machinery becomes the most powerful weapon in the war of capital against the working class, that the instruments of labor constantly tear the means of subsistence out of the hands of the laborer, that the very product of the worker is turned into an instrument for his subjugation. It is in the mode of production and uh, appropriation that we're talking here that machinery becomes the most powerful weapon in the in the war of capital against the working class, as put here, uh, in that the mechanical worker is the means of production itself and owned by, again, capital. The product of that labor is, again, appropriated exclusively by capital. Um, if that were different, machinery wouldn't be the ultimate weapon. <laughs> but that is the dynamic at play, and that's why it's important to understand that. We don't need to fear machines because they're going to destroy us. We need to fear machines because the product of all labor is appropriated by the capitalist class. Right. But like machines are cool yeah. in a communist society. Yeah. Badass even. Anyway, thus it comes about that the economizing of the instruments of labor becomes at the same time from the outset the most ridiculous waste of labor power and robbery based upon the normal conditions under which labor functions, that machinery 
the most powerful instrument for shortening labor time becomes the most unfailing means for placing every moment of the laborer's time and that of his family at the disposal of the capitalist for the purpose of expanding the value of his capital. Thus, it comes about that the overwork of some becomes the preliminary condition for the idleness of others, and that modern industry, which hunts after new consumers over the whole world, forces the consumption of the masses at home down to a starvation minimum, and in doing thus, destroys its own home market. The law that always equilibrates the relative surplus population, or industrial reserve army, also not to be confused with the way that Robert Thomas Malthus uses the term surplus population. Um, <laughs> Marx and Engels use surplus population to refer to uh, latent workers who can be used by capital more or less to replace people who might be striking, trying to get better conditions, et cetera, et cetera, can be brought in. Whereas Malthus uses the term surplus population and notate unproductive consumers. <laughs> Drags on society, welfare queens. Yeah, Peter is in the process of redoing their overpopulation video in the context of degrowth now included. And they are quoting Marx's critique of Malthus a lot. And we are both getting thorough enjoyment out of it. Too. Yeah. Marx is a saucy fella. Yeah, he's a little diva. And yeah. he's rude. And I like that. I love, like, he says that um, Malthus is plagiarizing Anderson, but whenever he adds his own it's stuff, pitiable. it's pitiable. Yeah, <laughs> his own contribution is pitiable. <laughs> the law that always equilibrates their relative surplus population or industrial reserve army to the extent and energy of accumulation, this law rivets the laborer to capital more firmly than the wedges of Vulcan did Prometheus to the rock. It's so gay. Yeah, it is. It's a really gay sounding sentence. I'm actually shocked I was able to say it like a sentence. Yeah. It establishes an accumulation of misery corresponding to the accumulation of capital. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is therefore at the same time accumulation of misery, agony of toil, slavery, ignorance, brutality, mental degradation at the opposite pole, i.e. on the side of the class that produces its own product in the form of capital. And to expect any other division of the products of the capitalist mode of production is the same as expecting the electrodes of a battery not to decompose acidulated water, not to liberate oxygen at the positive, hydrogen at the negative pole, so long as they are connected with the battery. Our bitch is so fucking strange with his metaphors sometimes. Nega Peter Buffett. Yeah, yeah. Strange metaphors for good causes. Yeah. Also, the metaphors aren't weirdly threatening. <laughs> I saw this hurricane ruin a town and just, kill people, and I was inspired to behave like it. <laughs> it killed 50 people and caused $14 billion in damage. I think I should be like that in terms of how I, in my philanthropy. I ex exert my philanthropy upon this town. <laughs> what the fuck? That dude's weird as shit. <laughs> We have seen that the ever-increasing perfectibility of modern machinery is, by the anarchy of social production, turned into a compulsory law that forces the individual industrial capitalist always to improve his machinery, always to increase its productive force. The bare possibility of extending the field of production is transformed for him into a similarly compulsory law. You really do just say the same thing a He's lot really, of time. He circles around a lot on this. It seems to be something he got very, very concentrated on. You know what? You know what? You know what? <laughs> the anarchy, the anarchy of production, man, it just makes him, he makes him have to keep upgrading his machines, man. This no. is Angle's personal Kotsky, but in conceptual form. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he's a factory owner, though. Think about yeah. it. Like, he's like, man, every single goddamn day, there's something that makes me have to upgrade my goddamn machines, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always having to upgrade the goddamn machines. And Marx is just like, chill out, man. <laughs> Let's just write, okay? It's like, no, man. That's not all I think about through the Let's day. Just write and then drink for three days. <laughs> the, the, Look, you can do that. I can't do that. I run a fucking factory, man. What was it? The, that agent report, like, spying on yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, no. And he just basically goes through periods of, like, manic writing and then just, like, sleeping and drinking for several days and then frantically <laughs> writing. Yeah. And, then Ingles busts through the door, like fucking Cosmo Kramer like hey, hey buddy <laughs> <laughs> I'm out <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, Mark and Eagles are doing the master of their domain contest. <laughs> They're doing the contest. <laughs> uh, I am out. That 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 fucking got me. That is done. I am done. <laughs> that shit was. That is well done. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Where the fuck were we? Um, the bare possibility of extending the field of production is transformed for him into a singularly compulsory law. The enormous expansive force of modern industry compared with that of gases as mere child's play appear to us now as a necessity for expansion, both qualitative and quantitative, that laughs at all resistance. Such resistance is offered by consumption, by sales, by the markets for the products of modern industry. But the capacity for extension, extensive and intensive, of the markets is primarily governed by quite different laws that work much less energetically. The extension of the markets cannot keep pace with the extension of production. The collision becomes inevitable, and as this cannot produce any real solution so long as it does not break in pieces the capitalist mode of production, the collisions become periodic. Capitalist production has begotten another vicious circle. As a matter of fact, since 1825, when the first general crisis broke out, the whole industrial and commercial world Production and exchange among all civilized peoples and their more or less barbaric hangers-on are thrown out of joint about once every 10 years. Commerce is at a standstill. The markets are glutted. Products accumulate as multitudinous as they are unsaleable. Hard cash disappears. Credit vanishes. Factories are closed. The mass of the workers are in want of the means of subsistence because they have produced too much of the means of subsistence. Bankruptcy follows upon bankruptcy. Execution upon execution. The stagnation lasts for years. Productive forces and products are wasted and destroyed wholesale. Until the accumulated mass of commodities finally filter off, more or less depreciated in value until production and exchange gradually begin to move again. Little by little, the pace quickens. It becomes a trot. The industrial trot breaks into a canter. The canter in turn grows into the headlong gallop of a perfect steeplechase of industry, commercial credit, and speculation, which finally, after breakneck leaps, ends where it began, in the ditch of a crisis. <laughs> it's literally like wizard people. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. <laughs> I am not even joking. That is what this sounds like. And so... Over and over again, <laughs> we have now, since the year 1825, <laughs> gone through this five times, and at the present moment, 1877, <laughs> 1877, we are going through it for the sixth time. And the character of these crises is so clearly defined that Fourier hit all of them off when he described the first crise plethorique, or a crisis from plethora. And I shall stop there. And Dumbledore told Hagrid he can just wait in the freaking car if he has to. <laughs> it really sounds like wizard people. There. Like, it really... Uh, it does. I, but, but just to summarize what's going on is that this contradiction that he continuously keeps talking about. <laughs> the, and he can't stop talking. And he can't <laughs> fucking stop talking about, for a good reason, the primary contradiction of capitalism is that production is socialized to the global working class while the product of their labor is privately appropriated. Private appropriation sustained while individual production became socialized. So the two classes are unified opposites with diametrically opposed interests and in that laborers are not getting compensated for what they're paid for and profits are not appropriated to them. Um, where capitalists want to generate as much profit as possible, which means more pressure on the socialized forces of production um, for inadequate compensation for the product of their labor. So as capitalists continue to do this at an increasing level, a greater and greater share of the product of the working class's labor put to themselves or appropriated to themselves, eventually the working class can't function as consumers. We have these overproduction of things that we don't need, uh, of luxuries or, or necessities spinners. or fidget spinners, silly bands, things that we don't need to buy that consumers can't buy because they're inadequately compensated for their labor. And so they can't actively participate in the market. 
And then under consumption of necessities, which when available cannot be afforded by the working class. And so it's this cyclic crisis where workers can't participate in the economy. And then that results in an economic bust, which is what um, Angles is talking about as happening for the sixth time since 1825. And then little by little, the pace quickens. It becomes a trot. (laughs) <laughs> the industrial trot breaks into a canter. <laughs> into a canter. The canter in turn grows to a headlong gallop of a perfect steeplechase of industry. That is crazy. It sounds it so- just yeah, it the fuck genuinely, like it. It literally sounds exactly like something Brad Neely would write. It does. Okay. In these crises, the contradiction between socialized production and capitalist appropriation ends in a violent explosion. The circulation of commodities is, for the time being, stopped. Money, the means of circulation, becomes a hindrance to circulation. All the loss of production and circulation of commodities are turned upside down. The economic collision has reached its apogee. The mode of production is in rebellion against the mode of exchange. So socialized mode of production is now incompatible with what's required to facilitate the market because the currency of the market, money, is not being exchanged because the majority of the population can't participate in it in the way that accommodates for the anarchy of production and what's being produced. Well said. Yeah. The fact that the socialized organization of production within the factory has developed so far that it has become incompatible with the anarchy of production in society, which exists side by side with and dominates it, is brought home to the capitalists themselves by the violent concentration of capital that occurs during crises through the ruin of many large and still greater number of small capitalists. These economic crises, and and this is something that's very easy to view in contemporary times, results in further consolidation of power within the largest capitalists. And this facilitates the ground for finance capital and imperialism. The wealth transfer that happened during the course of COVID. Yes. Yeah. Lenin would shit his fucking pants. Okay. He, he would just, he would have an aneurysm from that. Well, yeah. He, he did not have a good cerebral vascular No, he system. did not. Um, the whole mechanism of the capitalist mode of production breaks down under the pressure of the productive forces, its own creations. It is no longer able to turn all of this mass means of production into capital. They lie fallow. And for that very reason, the Industrial Reserve Army almost the Industrial Reserve Army must also lie fallow. Means of production, means of subsistence, available laborers, all the elements of production and of general wealth are present in abundance. But abundance becomes the source of distress and want. That was said by Fourier. Because it is the very thing that prevents the transformation of the means of production and subsistence into capital. For in a capitalistic society, the means of production can only function when they have undergone a preliminary transformation into capital into the means of exploiting human labor power. The necessity of this transformation in a capital of the means of production and subsistence stands like a ghost between these and the workers. It alone prevents the coming together of the material and the personal levers of production. It alone forbids the means of production to function, the workers to work and live. On the one hand, therefore, the capitalistic mode of production stands convicted of its own incapacity to further direct these productive forces. On the other, these productive forces themselves with increasing energy pressed forward to the removal of the existing contradiction, to the abolition of their quality as capital, to the practical recognition of their character as social production forces. This rebellion of the productive forces, as they grow more and more powerful against their quality as capital, the stronger and stronger command that their social character shall be recognized, forces the capital class itself to treat them more and more as social productive forces, so far as this is possible under capitalist conditions. The period of industrial high pressure, with its unbounded inflation of credit, not less than the crash itself by the collapse of the great capitalist establishments, tends to bring about that form of the socialization of the great masses and the means of production which we meet with in the different kinds of joint stock companies. Many of these means of production and of distribution are from the outset so colossal, like the railways, they exclude all other forms of capitalistic expansion. At a further stage of evolution, this form also becomes insufficient. 
the producers on a large scale in a particular branch of an industry in a particular country unite in a trust, a union for the purpose of regulating production. They determine the total amount to be produced, parcel it out among themselves, and thus enforce a selling price fix beforehand. But trusts of this kind, as soon as business becomes bad, are generally liable to break up, and on this very account compel a yet greater concentration of association, like I said, increasing, increasing consolidation of capitalism through these crises. COVID is such a good example. It is. The economy becomes more and more like a planned economy as... As this consolidation happens. Yes, as it's consolidated. It's not necessarily planned from the perspective of providing necessities to the populace. It is planned from the specific interests of the unaccountable ruling class. You might see the supply chain break down. You see a, a totally empty shelf at the store where the toilet paper or whatever is supposed to be. While at the same time, somehow they're making more and more money than ever. The whole of a particular industry has turned into one gigantic joint stock company. Internal competition gives place to the internal monopoly of this one company. This happened in 1890 with the English alkali production, which is now, after the fusion of 48 large works in the hands of one company, conducted upon a single plan and with a capital of six million pounds. How many media companies are there again? Yeah, what, like four? Like four? <laughs> in the trust, freedom of competition changes into its very opposite into monopoly, and the production without any definite plan of capitalist society capitulates the production upon a definite plan of the invading socialistic society. Certainly, this is so far still to the benefit and the advantage of the capitalists. But in this case, the exploitation is so palpable that it must break down. No nation will put up with the production conducted by trusts with so barefaced an exploitation of the community by a small band of dividend mongers. Then there's a, a very important text that comes out in 1917 that talks about this in great detail. In any case, with trusts or without, the official representative of capitalist society, the state, will ultimately have to undertake the direction of production. This necessity for conversion into state property is felt first in the great institutions for intercourse, hello, and communication, the post office, the telegraphs, the railways. If the crises demonstrate the incapacity of the bourgeoisie for managing any longer modern productive forces, the transformation of the great establishments for production and distribution into joint stock companies, trusts, and state property show how unnecessary the bourgeoisie are for that purpose. All the social functions of the capitalist has no further social function than that of pocketing dividends, tearing off coupons, and gambling on the stock exchange, where the different capitalists despoil one another of their capital. At first, the capitalistic mode of production forces out the workers. Now, it forces out the capitalists and reduces them, just as it reduced the workers, to the ranks of the surplus population, although not immediately into those of the Industrial Reserve Army. But the transformation, either into joint stock companies and trusts or into state ownership, does not do away with the capitalistic nature of productive forces. In the joint stock companies and trust, this is obvious. And the modern state, again, is only the organization that bourgeois society takes on in order to support the external conditions of the capitalist mode of production against the encroachments as well of the workers as of individual capitalists. The modern state, no matter what its form, is essentially a capitalist machine. The state of the capitalists, the ideal personification of total national capital. The more it proceeds to the taking over of productive forces, the more does it actually become the national capitalist, the more citizens does it exploit. The workers remain wage workers, proletarians. The capitalist relation is not done away with, it is rather brought to a head. But brought to a head, it topples over. State ownership of the productive forces is not the solution of the conflict, but concealed within it are the technical conditions that form the elements of that solution. This solution can only consist in the practical recognition of the social nature of the modern forces of production, and therefore in the harmonizing with the socialized character of the means of production. There it is. That's <laughs> that's that's what we've been talking about this whole time. Yeah. It is the contradiction between that sustained individualized appropriation of products and profits in contrast to production becoming socialized and the solution to 
that contradiction is resolving it in the appropriation of profits being compatible um, with the socialized nature of production. And this can only come about by society openly and directly taking possession of the productive forces, which have outgrown all control except that of society as a whole. The social character of the means of production and of the products today reacts against the producers, periodically disrupts all production and exchange, acts only like a law of nature working blindly, forcibly, destructively. But with the taking over by society of the productive forces, the social character of the means of production and the products will be utilized by the producers with a perfect understanding of its nature, and instead of being a source of disturbance and periodical collapse, will become the most powerful lever of production itself. Here's the key. The good shit is always in the negative space of the bad shit. The implication in the bad shit is that if you did it differently, yeah. <laughs> things could be much better. Right. That's and always there. A Marxist text format. We, we illustrate how dire the situation is in its historical context. And here's the, the fucking triumph. Active social forces work exactly like natural forces, blindly, forcibly, destructively, so long as we do not understand and reckon with them. But when once we understand them, when once we grasp their action, their direction, their effects, it depends only upon ourselves to subject them more and more to our own will, and by means of them to reach our own ends. And this holds quite especially of the mighty productive forces of today. As long as we obstinately refuse to understand the nature and the character of these social means of action, and this understanding goes against the grain of the capitalist mode of production and its defenders, so long these forces are at work in spite of us, in opposition to us, so long they master us, as we have shown above in detail. That is so critical. As long as we obstinately refuse to understand the nature and the character of these social means of action, which is what every synthetic leftist is telling you to do, that understanding the way that these forces operate or somebody encouraging you to understand that is being classist or elitist and is disconnected from the worker. They are taking you away from understanding the economic dynamics at play that mm -hmm. continue to oppress you as a worker. Which again is how power is distributed. Right. And it, that's so, what a useful mechanic or what a useful mechanism for the ruling class to have, to so, have some like, yes, shit on Twitter. yes, working class person, but some academic say, well, it's actually kind of classist for you to suggest that people should read because I can read, but I understand my privilege and being able to read. And, and understand angles. And, and so it's it's really um, uncouth for you to suggest um, that a worker might be capable of understanding what is happening to them and the mechanisms by which the bourgeoisie oppresses them. Let's be clear, all those people, they just want to go home after work every night and sit. That's all they want to do. They don't want to hear about theory. They don't want to understand the economic mechanisms of society. They don't have the time to understand it. They're working all the time. Don't you understand where these workers are coming from? Work. That's all they do. And they can't think. They don't have the time. I ha What I just read, I just highlighted. It just says good shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But... When once their nature is understood, they can, in the hands of the producers working together, be transformed from master demons into willing servants. The difference is as that between the destructive force of electricity and the lightning in the storm, and electricity under command of the telegraph and the voltaic arc. The difference between a conflagration and fire working in the service of man. With this recognition at last of the real nature of the productive forces of today, the social anarchy of production gives place to a social regulation of production upon a definite plan, according to the needs of the community and of each individual. Then the capitalist mode of appropriation, in which the product enslaves first the producer, and then the appropriator, is replaced by the mode of appropriation of the products that is based upon the nature of the modern means of production. Upon the one hand, direct social appropriation as means to the maintenance and extension of production, 
On the other, direct individual appropriation as a means of subsistence and of enjoyment. The solution, folks, there you have it. Whilst the capitalist mode of production more and more completely transforms a great majority of the population into proletarians, it creates the power which, under penalty of its own destruction, is forced to accomplish this revolution. Whilst its forces on more and more and the transformation of the vast means of production, already socialized into state property, it shows itself the way to accomplishing this revolution. The proletariat seizes political power and turns the means of production into state property. There you go. Marx wasn't a statist. Marx wasn't a statist. This is literally the other guy that invented Marxism, by the way. Yeah, this guy was like the guy who like kept giving Marx money to sit around and be Marx. And <laughs> drink and write. Yeah. <laughs> no, but Vosh is like, well, I'm just a straight Marxist. This I'm just a Mar libertarian You guys Marxism. do realize that uh, Karl Marx was a, a libertarian socialist, right? Right, my dudes? <laughs> but in doing this, it abolishes itself as proletariat. Abolishes all class distinction and class antagonisms. It abolishes also the state as state. Society thus far based upon class antagonisms had need of the state. That is, of an organization of the particular class, which was pro tempora, the exploiting class, an organization for the purpose of preventing any interference from without with the existing conditions of production. And therefore, especially for the purpose of forcibly keeping the exploited classes in the condition of oppression corresponding with a given mode of production, slavery, serfdom, wage labor. The state was the official representative of society as a whole, the gathering of it together into a visible embodiment. But it was this only insofar as it was the state of that class which itself represented for the time being society as a whole. In ancient times, the state of slave-owning citizens. In the Middle Ages, the feudal lords. In our times, in our own times, the bourgeoisie. When at last it becomes the real representative of the whole of society, it renders itself unnecessary. As soon as there is no longer any social class to be held in subjection, as soon as class rule and the individual struggle for existence based upon our present anarchy and production, with the collisions and excesses arising from these, are removed, nothing more remains to be repressed, and a special repressive force, a state, is no longer necessary. The first act by virtue of which the state really constitutes itself, the representative of the whole society, the taking possession of the means of production in the name of society, this is, at the same time, its last independent act as a state. State interference in social relations becomes, in one domain after another, superfluous, and then dies out of itself. The government of persons is replaced by the administration of things and by the conduct of processes of production. The state is not abolished. It dies out. This gives the measure of the value of the phrase, a free state, both as to its justifiable use at times by agitators and as to its ultimate scientific insufficiency, and also of the demands of the so-called anarchists for the abolition of the state out of hand. A state is established for the purpose of it withering away in a proletarian, proletarian state. Yeah. Obviously, we do not live in a proletarian state currently. And we can't use the bourgeois state machinery to form a proletarian state. Um, which, well, if we're going to throw down about how Marx is a libertarian, and, according and to Vosch. And vote for Biden. Unless, unless you're fucking Kotskyist, which you ain't welcome in these parts. But uh, the, the state machinery, according to uh, Marx, was something that would have to be more or less reinvented uh, as a proletarian state. You would have to get rid of certain mechanisms and create new mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. However, the proletarian state would be established specifically to oppress the bourgeoisie out of existence. Now, that doesn't mean to kill those people. The point is to make it so there is not a, an owning class and a class that sells its labor and or could sell its labor. Since the historical appearance of the capitalist mode of production, the appropriation by society of all the means of production has often been dreamed of, more or less vaguely, by individuals as well as by sects as the ideal of the future. But it could become possible, could become a historical necessity, 
only when the actual conditions for its realization were there. Like every other social advance, it becomes practicable not by men understanding that the existence of classes is in contradiction to justice, equality, etc., not by the mere willingness to abolish these classes, but by virtue of a certain by virtue of certain new economic conditions. The separation of society into an exploiting and an exploited class, a ruling and an oppressed class, was the necessary consequences of the deficient and restricted development of production in former times. So long as the total social labor only yields a produce which but slightly exceeds that barely necessary for the existence of all, so long, therefore, as labor engages all or almost all the time of the great majority of members of society, so long, of necessity, this society is divided into classes. Side by side with the great majority, exclusively bond slaves to labor, arises a class freed from directly productive labor, which looks after the general affairs of society, the direction of labor, state business, law, science, art, etc. It is, therefore, the law of division of labor that lies at the basis of the division into classes. But this does not prevent this division into classes from being carried out by means of violence and robbery, trickery and fraud. It does not prevent the ruling class once having the upper hand, from consolidating its power at the expense of the working class, from turning its social leadership into an intensified exploitation of the masses. And holy shit, has that ever happened? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. If you're wondering, that's what life is like. <laughs> but if, upon this showing, division into classes has a certain historical justification, it has this only for a given period, only under given social conditions. It was based upon the insufficiency of production. It will be swept away by the complete development of modern productive forces. And, in fact, the abolition of classes in society presupposes a degree of historical evolution at which the existence, not simply of this distinction itself, oh, sorry, not simply of this or that particular ruling class, but of any ruling class at all, and therefore the existence of class distinction itself, has become an obsolete anachronism. It presupposes, therefore, the development of production carried out to a degree at which the appropriation of the means of production and of the products and, with this, of political domination, of the monopoly of culture, and of intellectual leadership by a particular class of society has become not only superfluous, but economically, politically, intellectually a hindrance to development. This point is now reached. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's still being it's still, it's still going. We, it's that, still they, prolonged. They've prolonged that point for a while. I just can't imagine what the foundational historical materialist would think today. Mm. Uh, oh, that point is now reached. Their political and intellectual bankruptcy is scarcely any longer a secret to the bourgeoisie themselves. They know. Their economic bankruptcy recurs regularly every 10 years. In every crisis, society is suffocated beneath the weight of its own productive forces and products, which it cannot use, and stands helpless face to face with the absurd contradiction that the producers have nothing to consume because consumers are wanting. The expansive force of the means of production bursts the bonds that the capitalist mode of production had imposed upon them. Their deliverance from these bonds is the one precondition for an unbroken, constantly accelerated development of the productive forces, and therewith for a part practically unlimited increase of production itself, nor this at all. The socialized appropriation of the means of production does away, not only with the present artificial restrictions upon production, but also with the positive waste and devastation of productive forces and products that are at the present time the inevitable concomitants of production, and that reached their height in the crisis. Further, it sets free for the community at large a massive means of production and of products by doing away with the senseless extravagance of the ruling classes of today and their political representatives. The possibility of securing for every member of society by means of socialized production an existence not only fully sufficient materially and becoming day-to-day -day more full, but an existence guaranteeing to all the free development and exercise of their physical and mental faculties. This possibility is now, for the first time, here, but it is here. With the seizing of the means of production by society, production of commodities is done away with, 
and simultaneously the mastery of the product over the producer. Remember how we said before, the product controls the producer um, in the conditions of anarchy of production. Anarchy and social production is then replaced by systematic definite organization. The struggle for individual existence disappears. Then for the first time, man in a certain sense is finally marked off from the rest of the animal kingdom and emerges from mere animal conditions of existence into really human ones. The whole sphere of conditions of life which environ man and which have hitherto ruled man now comes under the dominion and control of man who for the first time becomes the real conscious lord of nature because he has now become master of his own social organization. The laws of his own social action, hitherto standing face to face with man as the laws of nature foreign to and dominating him, will then be used with full understanding and so mastered by him. Man's own social organization, hitherto confronting him as a necessity imposed by nature and history, now becomes the result of his own free action. The extraneous objective forces that have hitherto governed history pass under the control of man himself. Only from that time will man himself more and more consciously make his own history. Only from that time will the social causes set in movement by him have, in the main and in a constantly growing measure, the results intended by him. It is the ascent of man from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom. And when people tell you, when those people tell you that it's elitist to read theory and that the suggestion or encouragement to read theory and to understand this um, is elitist and disconnected from the worker. They are preventing you. They are discouraging you from contributing to this revolutionary potential. Because it is within the understanding of the systems of today that the means to transition to the systems of tomorrow will be discovered. Yes, that the working class subdues them and controls these forces of nature once operating, once we're living in them, just necessarily reacting to them, subdued to human will so that we can live in a society in which every person can self-actualize and live a fruitful life free of oppression. So anybody telling you not to attempt to understand that. And to present a positive vision for the future that we can all believe in, as opposed to. As opposed to actually understanding this through a historical materialist lens and applying dialectical materialism to history and thus understanding history in a material way, is anti-communist and discouraging the working class actively. The largest leftists, whatever. Um, are the people telling you to forget about this? It's not important. It's not important. Communism. Oh, we could just will that into existence by voting. Um, using the bourgeois machinery, which like doesn't even really. That's like even less. Well, it's, it's way less it's than dumb. utopian socialism. Yeah, utopian liberalism. But yeah, um, th that is active dissuasion of working people to understand the conditions under which they're living and to revolutionize. And it, it is disgusting. And any time you see that, I want you to push back on that. <laughs> Let's briefly sum up our sketch of historical evolution, why we call it historical materialism. He's going to show us how the economic base changes over time as a result of changing historical conditions and how those historical conditions have now evolved to a point where <laughs> at Angle's time, this is possible. <laughs> and we're here now. And it's still possible. Maybe we'll do neo-feudalism first. Who knows? Let's um, hope not. <laughs> well, anyway, let's briefly sum up our sketch of historical evolution. One, medieval society individual production on a small scale, means of production adapted for individual use, hence primitive, ungainly, petty, dwarfed in action, production for immediate consumption, either of the producer himself or his feudal lord. Only where an excess of production over this consumption occurs is such excess offered for sale and enters into exchange. Production of commodities, therefore, only in its infancy, but already it contains within itself, in embryo, 
anarchy in the production of society at large. Two, capitalist revolution. Transformation of industry at first to be a means of simple cooperation and manufacture. Concentration of the means of production hitherto scattered into great workshops. As a consequence, their transformation from individual to social means of production, a transformation which does not, on the whole, affect the form of exchange. The old forms of appropriation remain in force. The capitalist appears. In his capacity as owner of the means of production, he also appropriates the products and turns them into commodities. Production has become a social act. Exchange and appropriation continue to be individual acts, the acts of individuals. The social product is appropriated by the individual capitalist. Fundamental contradiction. Once arise all the contradictions in which our present day society moves and which modern industry brings to light. Peter, carry it out. All right. A. Severance of the producer from the means of production. Condemnation of the worker to wage labor for life. Antagonism between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. B. Growing predominance and increasing effectiveness of the laws governing the production of commodities. Unbridled competition. Contradiction between socialized organization in the individual factory and social anarchy in the production as a whole. C. On the one hand, perfecting of machinery made by competition compulsory for each individual manufacturer and complemented by a constantly growing displacement of laborers, industrial reserve army. On the other hand, unlimited extension of production also compulsory under competition for every manufacturer. On both sides, unheard of development of productive forces, excess of supply over demand, overproduction and products, access there of laborers without employment and without means of existence. But these two levers of production and of social well-being are unable to work together because the capitalist form of production prevents the productive forces from working and the products from circulating, unless they are first turned to capital, which their very superabundance prevents. The contradiction has grown into an absurdity. The mode of production rises in rebellion against the form of exchange. D. Partial recognition of the social character of the productive forces forced upon the capitalists themselves. Taking over the great institutions for production and communication, first by joint stock companies, later in by trusts, then by the state. The bourgeoisie demonstrated to be a superfluous class. All its social functions are now performed by salaried employees. Three. Proletarian revolution. Solution of the contradictions. The proletariat seizes the public power and by means of this transforms the socialized means of production (laughs) slipping from the hands of the bourgeoisie into public property. By this act, the proletariat frees the means of production from the character of capital they have thus far borne and gives their socialized character complete freedom to work itself out. Socialized production upon a predetermined plan becomes henceforth possible. The development of production makes the existence of different classes of society thenceforth an anachronism. In proportion as anarchy and social production vanishes, the political authority of the state dies out. Man, at last the master of his own form of social organization, becomes at the same time the lord over nature, his own master, free. To accomplish this act of universal emancipation is the historical mission of the modern proletariat to thoroughly comprehend the historical conditions and thus the very nature of this act, to impart the now oppressed proletarian class a full knowledge of the conditions and of the meaning of the momentous act it is called upon to accomplish. This is the task of the theoretical expression of the proletarian movement, scientific socialism. Fuck yeah. Understanding what is said in this text, that is definitionally what class consciousness is. So when those academic rad libs who tell you that you shouldn't be reading theory and that that's disconnected from the needs of the working class, when they tell you that and then say that you need to be class conscious at the same time. And that you need to participate in the general strike on October 15th to be class consciousness and spread the class right, consciousness which if you're from doing, the learn and about page. Which if you're doing that, then you inherently don't understand these dynamics and are not class conscious class consciousness comes about by understanding the conditions that exist currently the conditions that exist currently are class society how does class society express itself in capitalism 
That's the point of this text. That is the point of most Marxist texts. Historical conditions from feudalism to capitalism in its infancy stages to capitalism where socialized production was in full force in contradiction to the individualized appropriation of profits made fertile grounds for periodic crises over and over resulting from the anarchy of production and the vicious cycle resulting from this contradiction of workers not being able to participate in the economy with an underproduction of necessities and overproduction of luxuries. As that increase in consolidation happens with these continued crises and the introduction of thereafter finance capital and the imperial stage of capitalism that we are so, so far into now, mm. further than these theorists could have imagined, the, the working class increases as this concentration of wealth increases. And this is fertile ground for the establishment, the authoritarian establishment of proletarian rule over the bourgeoisie. In doing so, that state withers away as we introduce um, a mode of appropriation that is compatible with the socialized forces of production. Um, therein, giving us way to an economy that is planned according to the needs of society and the needs of each individual and giving way to conditions in which every single person can live a life in which they self-actualize, in which they live in abundance. And that is the result, the theoretical expression of historical materialism and applying that to history, knowing that and understanding that and subduing those forces through our understanding to the will of the working class is how that society is achieved. And that is a theoretical expression of the proletarian movement. Scientific socialism applied. That's all for today. Thanks again for watching or listening. This is Pact. I'm Peter. This is Miss Astronaut Cowboy Doctor. To help us out, click like, follow, subscribe, whatever. Leave us five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Audible. To support us, become a patron at patreon.com slash pactpod. That's P-A-C-D-P-O-D. Thanks so much, guys. We will see you later.